Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to give everybody a couple more minutes to log in, and then we'll kick off. All right. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today for our webinar, Operations, Execution, and Action with RPM Pizza. A few housekeeping items up front. We will have time at the end for Q&A, so please go ahead and submit any questions that you have throughout the presentation in the questions pane of GoToWebinar. Any that we don't get to, we can follow up with you offline. Um, and we will be recording today's session, so look out for an email following up with a recording of the webinar. With that, we're thrilled to have John Richards, the Chief Operations Officer of RPM Pizza, joined by our CEO, Vladek Richter, for today's presentation. So with that, Vladek, I'll pass it to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Cassie. <clears throat> good morning or good afternoon and potentially even good evening to some of you um, that are joining in from all, all around the world. Um, let me uh, give you guys a bit of a, uh, an agenda overview of what we're going to cover today. So uh, we're going to start off a little bit on the uh, state of restaurant operations. Uh, we'll dig in a bit afterwards into uh, the background in RPM and, and John himself. Uh, we'll talk about the operational challenges uh, of, of what they were running and how they were running it the old way. And then we'll talk a bit about uh, what they've been doing with uh, the uh, what's input in the operations execution platform after its, um, after its uh, adoption and deployment. Um, so let me go ahead and get uh, going initially. So uh, operators today face really high stake challenges, right? Um, all of us uh, uh, across the industry face you know, the, uh, the same sort of things no matter where we are, right? We've got costly wages uh, and turnover. I think we're up to uh, now maybe uh, 20, uh, 20 states that have now increased their, um, their minimum wage uh, across the United States. Uh, turnover and uh, the ability to keep employees today is, a, is an ongoing battle with, um, with the low employment rate. Uh, we've got a lot of lack of visibility across stores, right? So as, as we're operating in a dozen, two dozen, 100, 500 locations uh, or more uh, across the country or across many countries, it's difficult to get a real uh, uh, beat on everything that's happening at every location at any given point in time. And naturally, the pace of competitor innovation is moving at a, at a speed of, uh, in some ways, maybe uh, unlike any, uh, any other time in history. Uh, Third-party delivery uh, being a big, uh, big hit for that over the last uh, over the last couple of years. Now, what we have found along the way is uh, operators end up prioritizing kind of two things, right? The main ones. One is, can we find efficiencies through automation, right? Can we find a way to better improve the things that we're uh, that we're doing day to day? Can we find a way to take out labor out of those processes? And can we increase the quality of the execution as well? Is there a way for us to potentially uh, leverage the business and make sure that we're delivering better products uh, in a faster time period uh, to more happier customers on a regular basis? Now, our customers uh, come to us um, specifically around this uh, uh, to, to help them deliver on this operations execution platform. And to give you guys a little bit of a, uh, an overview on what it is that uh, Zepo does today, we've got kind of a, a set of core capabilities that we deploy into different solutions uh, within the business. So our capabilities around task management, around audits, 
uh, and corrective actions, uh, incident, manage, incident mitigation, and operational intelligence are deployed in different solution sets within the organization, among brand standards, amongst food safety, marketing and merchandises, and other key processes. We operate as kind of the, uh, the, the heartbeat of your operations team, where your team members pick up uh, the product as soon as, they, as soon as they've clocked into work and immediately get delivered work that they need to do throughout the day to make sure that they're staying on top of all the different um, uh, key items that we need to get done at any given location or in the field. Now we've been operating for a little over six years uh, across 40,000 locations and uh, a little over 35 countries, uh, operating with phenomenal brands like, uh, like Domino's, like Chipotle, Buffalo Wild Wings, Five Guys, KFC, uh, Sweet Green, amongst many others, right? So we're, uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen all different segments of the, uh, of the food service world, and we get to see it in all sorts of different uh, slices, whether it's in, in, in Norway, in Saudi Arabia, in the US, or even as far off as Papua New Guinea. So let's talk a little bit about RPM and, uh, and what you guys are here to, uh, to take a look at and to, to hear from, uh, from RPM itself. Um, John, I'm going to let you do a little bit of, uh, of the intro on RPM Pizza and its background uh, over, the, over the years. And I'll let you kind of uh, take this away and then we'll, we'll take it step by step. Awesome. Well, thanks again for uh, having me on here today. And thanks, everybody, for calling in as um, the more Zenput can help learn from everybody, the more, you know, it helps RPM Pizza get better as well. So I love being able to kind of collaborate with everybody in and around all the different brands. Um, as I said earlier, I'm our Chief Operations Officer for RPM Pizza. We're the do largest Domino's franchise in the United States. You know, we're spread out over 50 states and 180 plus locations. We've been in Louisiana, Mississippi for almost 39 years now, and then have uh, recently in the last five years gone into Indiana and Michigan. Um, and, you know, we have over 3,800 team members and, um, and, and pretty much, uh, for me, it's a little background here, and I don't know if that was, you know, if I, but anyways, we I started with RPM about 15 years ago, and uh, as just a CSR answering the phones over the counter, you know, behind the counter, and have worked up to uh, the COO position for RPM. Awesome, fantastic. That's the background. Um, let's talk about a little bit of uh, some of the challenges you guys are facing, right? You've got five states, you've got 180 locations. Um, what's the uh, uh, we've got a couple of them listed off here, but would love to hear from kind of your words, uh, the things that sort of keep you up at night and sometimes uh, even engage maybe too close with the phone over the weekends. Yeah, so one of the things that we were looking for um, about three and a half years ago was we really wanted to standardize RPM Pizza's, you know, standard operating procedures. And we wanted to kind of re-up it a little more and use technology and be kind of the early adapters, at least for us, into, uh, into technology. And you know what we call our standard operating procedures is the RPM way. And we were really looking for a way to verify that we were kind of getting these things done exactly the way we wanted them, whether you were in New Orleans, Louisiana, or you know Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, and because we felt that if we could, we knew that we know the process works. I mean, the process has been tested. You know, the results are there. We've just got to figure out how to get people basically to be accountable to following up on executing the RPMP today so that once again, you know, we've kind of got the same operations, you know, in store one or store 183. And, um, and that was kind of our biggest challenges, you know, three years ago before we got into our, uh, before we got partnered with Zimput was, you know, how can we do these things and how can we verify that these things are getting done being the way we did it, but also kind of making sure that we didn't have, you know, our multi-unit supervisors only having three or four locations. How can we maximize, you know, their their performance and their abilities as well by continuing to, you know, utilize input? Phenomenal. Okay, that's that, that, that's great to hear. And you guys had um, obviously a, a way of running this process for the first, you know, uh, 30, 40 years that you were in business. Uh, so take us through a little bit of <clears throat> what was the sort of before uh, picture of how uh, of how business used to get done um, before you know, we, we started partnering together? Yes, yeah, so when we first got involved with Zimput, our main way was, like we kind of talked about, was you know, verifying that we were doing the RPM pizza way, but we also had no real accountability to what our multi-unit supervisors were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, other than each week of the period, so each all, all four of the weeks, they had two different assignments that they had to do each week, and those were just done on carbon copied paper and they'd mail in at the end of the period 
um, you know, that they did those sheets. And as long as they were received at our main office before Thursday of the next period, you know, you got paid your bonus. If they didn't get them, then you didn't give your assignment. You got deducted bonus. However, that didn't mean and doesn't mean I wasn't one of them that occasionally made sure Sunday night at my on my couch so that all my sheets were just filled out and turned in and put in the mail Monday morning and sent out, you know, not necessarily doing them from inside the store and the way they were supposed to be done. So we were really looking for a way to help make our multi-unit supervisors better by using our systems and using the training and the tools that we have and verifying that they were doing them because we know that if they're doing, I mean, there are coaches that are out in the field. If they're out doing their, you know, their audits and their coaching, then they're making our team do better, uh, be better team members and execute at a higher rate. The only problem was I didn't have, like I said, it, the sheet could have come in. We didn't have the resources or the time to make sure that everything was done good. We weren't able to follow up. I mean, somebody could have scored somebody a 30 or a fail on one of their audits, but as long as they got it mailed in in time, then it didn't really matter. It was okay. And at the end of the day, our customers suffered because we weren't able to track and verify that these jobs were getting done the way they needed to do. We also couldn't really look out the windshield very well and say, hey, Store one, two, three, four, got a 30 on this visit. They got a 25 on the visit before, and they got a 50 on the visit before. You know, now they're going backwards. What's our plan to make sure we, you know, turn the ship around and develop better action plans for the team, which in general would help the customer get a better experience as well. That's a great, that's a great background. Um, and I'm sure probably a lot of folks in the audience can probably uh, relate to that today. Um, now, we obviously got uh, engaged along the way, and we talked about, I think you and I had these conversations relatively early on of sort of uh, trying to find a better way to, to help operations, uh, to help the operations teams execute on a regular basis. Um, and I think the, the, to be able to do that, to be able to kind of generate those great customer experiences, you need to be able to, be able to do three, three things, right? You need to be able to get better visibility into that store performance, exactly what you're talking about, right? Is it getting a 30? Is it getting a 40? Is it getting a 100? Is it constantly getting a 100? Because you want to celebrate those wins, right? You want to make sure that in those cases, uh, those stores are getting uh, accolades and uh, are known that they're top performers. Um, you want to be able to find some way to automate some of these follow-ups, these corrective actions, so that uh, as, a, as a district manager, as a field leader, when I'm coming into one of these locations, I know that um, I've left a list of things that I want you to be able to do, that I need you to be able to do, and I need to see that those things are getting accomplished uh, along the way. Right? So I think that's a, that's a big important piece of it, right? It's hard to close the loop without making sure that the team is actually following through on the things you've asked them to. And the last thing, I think, John, you've, you've said this a lot, right? Trust but verify, right? Making sure that, um, uh, making sure that we're finding uh, a way to, uh, to hold our people uh, accountable. We trust them, but we want to make sure that they're getting the work done. Yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, kind of my job is to make sure in all 100 and all our locations that everybody's doing their job the RPM way. And I just want to make sure I've got a way to verify it. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about uh, each one of these sections piece by piece, right? Let's talk about um, visibility and store performance, right? Um, what is it that you guys end up kind of digging into um, in the in the early onsets of um, as you came on to that, but more more so today um, to get a better grasp on how the uh, how the stores and how the districts and the regions are performing. Well, first of all, we really wanted to just make sure that people adapted to the system. And like we said, you know, we're we're we were we were started in 1981, and you know, quite a few of our district managers today were team members within the first couple three years of the uh, the you know of RPM founded, and so. You know, kind of, I hate to say, you know, teach an old dog new tricks, but we had to make sure that people who had been doing this job for a long time were going to adapt to putting down the paper and pen and using the tablet or the phone or whatever it would do to do that. So really at first, it was kind of more of a compliance. Hey, let's just get everybody to do 100% usage first. We, we didn't really want to dip our toe in after a while, we realized, hey, the only way we're going to be really successful in this and use this opportunity is we've just got to, you know, cannonball into the pool and get everybody going here and get everybody on the system. Once we got everybody on the system and people realized how much easier their life was due to the automated triggers and due to the different systems that Zimput will help them and giving them the historical trends, that part just kind of came with it that we didn't even really need 
the training from Zimput from the team, the customer service team, because the people were already kind of being the early adopters. Like, wait a second, didn't I give them a bad score last time? Or didn't they get two in a row great scores this time? And they had it right there at their fingertips in the, lo in the store's location. And they were able to also say, hey, you told me you were going to do X, Y, and Z last time, and it's still not done because they had all of it there, right there at their fingertips. And really that was kind of the, the icebreaker. We just had to make sure everybody used the system. And then the system itself made everybody's life that much easier, which made our supervisors and our stores, you know, really flock to the dashboard to make sure they were looking at kind of the trends and the graphs and the scores and the triggers and that aspect of everything. Yep. And I, I'm curious, you, you, you talk about, um, <clears throat> you're talking about getting them to use the system. How much was there a push and how much was there a pull for some of this, right? Was there a chunk of the organization where you had to sort of kind of go, hey guys, you know, we're, we're moving in this direction. You might not be the first adopters in there, uh, but need to get you on board. Or was there even some of their team members or their peers uh, from other regions pushing them as well? I mean, talk a little bit about kind of like the, the change management aspect of, uh, of having to get that accomplished. Yeah. And I think originally when we first when I first met you, Vlad, we kind of said, hey, let's just test it because it was going to be a large investment for us. I mean, you know, with the size of our operate, you know, organization and stuff, you know, it was like, hey, let's just test it, see if it works. We started at the store level and we didn't really get off the ground very much. And then I realized, you know what, it's not really the store level that I wanted to start with anyways. I wanted to make sure that our supervisors were out doing their job because there's the ones that, you know, you don't always know where they are every day and what they're doing. And so we went all into the supervisors and that's when we realized for us and, and probably with input as well, you can't just dip your toe in the water. As I kind of mentioned, we, we went all in and once we kind of, you know, pulled the bandaid off and just said, Hey, you have to do it this way at the supervisors. It was much, it wasn't that hard because I mean, most of our supervisors, you know, they get paid really well. They realize, hey, they've got to be compliant and do what kind of the, they're the brand ambassadors. And if the brand is asking for us to go this route, then they're going to go that route for us. Um, and they realize it's their job to educate, and motivate. Whereas when we were with the store level, the supervisors didn't really know all the answers because they hadn't really been on, they'd been on this input just as long as the general manager. So by starting with the supervisors, they hmm. were able to know the system kind of inside and out, at least for what they needed to do and what they were asking their general managers to do and their assistant managers at the store level, you know, it's kind of how can I, you know, ask you to do something if, if I don't know how to do it kind of deal. So once we went that route and we had the supervisors, even the ones that were 30 years tenured of doing things, pen, pencil and paper, convinced that, hey, this is the way to go. It was super easy for them to kind of hold their stores accountable because they knew how much easier it made their life and how much easier it's going to make the store's life. Yeah, that's fantastic. That, 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 that's great insight. So let's, let's take a look a little, a little bit and kind of the, the the second part of that on the automated follow-ups, right? You guys have spent a lot of time talking about making sure things don't fall through the cracks and that making sure that people are being held accountable um, for issues at the stores. Um, how, where, what are the areas you probably end up finding this to be the most impactful in? And maybe talk a little bit about just in general um, some of the, the follow-ups and the corrective actions that, uh, that you guys end up uh, finding most use of in the system. Yeah, so a couple of the main things that we use is obviously around food safety, which I'll come back to that, but our team member safety, as we are in kind of some high crime areas um, and some kind of more difficult areas to manage, uh, are, are to stay safe in per se. So we have what we call our safety visit, and it has to be done after 5 p.m., and the street lights basically have to be on, and because we want the team to take a picture of all the lights showing that they're working and stuff, you know, and all the safety cameras working, you know, all that good stuff to make sure that from the resource center and from the, you know, the above store level, we're doing everything we can possible. Cameras are working, lights are working, uh, locks are working, safes are working, you know, all that type stuff to make sure that the stores are as safe as possible. So that all they have to do is worry about take making bacon of the pizzas and not and following the procedures of our safety um you know of our safety procedures and that they'll stay safe and so the good news is, is hey if it said that no our street light was out you know our our building light was out it could create an automatic task and trigger to for the dm to remember when they sit down at their computer to put in that work order to get whatever it needed to get fixed 
And so for the team member safety, you know, kind of utilizing those triggers, absolutely. And then also, obviously, with things around food safety, if temperatures were trending a little higher than normal or whatnot, we could create, you know, notifications to make sure you yeah, were doing the same as well. And, um, and then basically also recording our temperature logs to see the trends of all the different items and the things as opposed to um, just a handwritten that could possibly get lost or manipulated or whatever of food, you know, a temperature log kind of deal. Now we've got an automated, easy to access, easy to review from the office um, temperature log per se of all of our different items. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's uh, that, that's great to hear. And, uh, do you guys end up um, in some ways kind of archiving some of that information or uh, kind of accessing it from time to time as necessary? I'm curious as to like in, in the environments where you need to go get it, um, how often do you access it? Is it mostly infrequent? Um, honestly, it is probably not access. It's more of a need to use kind of basis, if that makes sense. You know, when we need it, we have it and we know it's there. But then also we do use it for if the store does get a bad audit or if the store does get a bad visit or if their data seems, to, you know, if their performance seems to be trending down, then myself or our director can go back and utilize that data to say, hey, you've had this issue going on. We've done X, Y, and Z steps. You just haven't, you know, done the final thing to cross the finish line to get these done. So it's helped make us hold our team a lot more accountable because they know we have that data, you know, at the axis of our fingertips kind of deal. Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. Um, all right. Let's talk about the, the, uh, your favorite, your favorite phrase that uh, comes up. I think maybe every time I end up seeing you um, trust, but verify, right. Uh, talk to me about trust, but verify. And if you remember even the first time uh, you and I met some of the things that you had said to me about what would have happened if the system was in place when you were getting up and uh, when you were a district manager. Yes, yeah, so one of my main jobs and my, like I said, you know, is to make sure that all of our stores are operating through the RPM Pizza way. And, you know, this is our way to make sure that, you know, that I'm kind of, you know, cover my ass that making sure that everything's done the way we want it to be done. And that, you know, I trust that you're doing it right, but I'm verifying that, you know, this is just me verifying that you're doing it right. And by that, you know, as you've kind of see, hey, was the lobby clean and put back together? Did they close the right way? Did you sweep in that corner or clean that baseboard? Okay, cool, we'll submit a picture to say that you did kind of deal. Did you do it from the actual store location or did you do it from the couch of your living room while watching Sunday night football? You know, that kind of stuff. So all those different things have really helped us, um, you know, make sure that our store perform our stores were clean, our stores were operating the right way. Our stores were, hey, you know, we wanted to grade pizzas. We wanted to grade the crust rise. We wanted to grade the different things. And in the past, it was just, you know, a checkbox, yes or no. But now I'm able to see that picture that they took on their phone and then help walk the supervisor through. Hey, tell me why that's a great pizza. Tell me why that's a not great pizza. You know, tell me why you took this off or why did you say this? Ha you know, so I'm able to kind of kind of get to the root cause around every item that, the team is seeing in there to make sure that I know what's going on through their head. And then I can also kind of help mend them through the ways they need to get to. And, um, you know, quite honestly, if our CEO came today and said, Hey, you know, we can't have input anymore. We've got to make some cuts or whatever it might be. Then that would make my job a whole lot more difficult and, um, you know, very strenuous to kind of make sure that all these different things were done the way we wanted them to do. No, it's, um, that, 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 that's good to understand. It sounds like if you got if we got replaced, you'd probably have to go hire another person just to keep up with all this stuff. Yeah, no doubt. Or, <laughs> or you might be hiring me. <laughs> I hope my boss isn't on. Just jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, obviously none of these things matter as much if they don't have impact to the bottom line or, or somewhere within the business. Um, you know, you guys have seen uh, kind of some pretty phenomenal results of the last couple of years. Talk to us a little bit about um, uh, the results and maybe some, what they mean specifically in your context, because uh, I'm sure some of the folks in, uh, um, in other brands might not be using the same sort of language that you guys do. Yeah. So, I mean, really the kind of the middle one is the important one for us is what are we doing to get better every single day? I know if I can get better every single day and I can go to work to make a difference, 
then I know whichever way you wanted to score me on is only going to get better because I'm doing my job to the best of my abilities and I want to continue to outperform, you know, where we used to be in the past. And so decreasing our repeat violations was kind of, is kind of key for us in the fact that if I know I missed this today, but I'm working to get it fixed and I'm working to look out that windshield to make sure it stays fixed and I'm putting in kind of the system and process in place to make sure that it is fixed you know, then, then I know I don't have to worry about that issue tomorrow and I can start working towards another issue. And so really, you know, basically we've seen, you know, kind of our scores go up on a you know, 100 point scale, you know, to the 80s to 90 range, 21%. And then, um, you know, and really the way we've done that is just making sure that we've decreased our repeat violations. Um, and overall, the way we get scored is just the operational evaluations report. And we've seen a large increases in there as well. And the operations evaluation report is something you guys are self-reporting, or this is, um, or this is something with uh, with uh, Domino's corporate. So this is Domino's corporate, and then we also have an internal team that we measure ourselves on. Fantastic. That okay. we can get well, more fre- that we can get visited way more frequently. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I, a long time ago, a smart man once told me software is just a tool and you, at the end of the day, like a hammer, you got to do something with it. So um, I'm glad that we're playing a very, very small part in you guys being able to use um, uh, the tool and solution to, uh, to be able to achieve these kind of results. Um, it's phenomenal to see that. And I, uh, I appreciate you allowing us to kind of uh, participate in that process. Um, as we're kind of uh, uh, coming to the conclusion of the uh, initial portions of the, uh, the, of the webinar and review, we'd love to open this up for, uh, for Q&A uh, amongst the audience. So as, um, as questions roll in, I believe that there's a, um, uh, there's a way for you guys to be able to ask questions uh, directly through there. And we'll be able to pull some of those questions out and then, uh, and then propose them to the rest of the group. Great. Thank you. We do have some questions coming in. And as Ladek said, feel free to continue submitting through the questions pane of GoToWebinar. Um, but we'll go ahead and kick off with the ones that have come through. Uh, <clears throat> so, John, do you use a dedicated person to oversee the use of Zenput? So, we don't necessarily use a dedicated person to oversee the use of Zenput. Um, other than every morning I get our compliance reports. And, you know, I know that basically if the compliance is getting done, that the people are going to use the data that it's given to make their job better. So I kind of just review compliance every Monday morning. And then any kind of, ch- I do have one or two kind of uh, a resource center, um, internal person, and then a, a, a director of operations to kind of help. They are the two that basically help mold and conform and change or whatever we need to do to our actual forms that we are using. Um, but that we don't necessarily have one person that just monitors the usage of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I think to, to sort of piggyback off that, by the way, I think it, it depends a little bit on the, on the size, right? So I think there's there are cases where uh, we've seen folks that um, probably about, maybe the breakage happens around four or 500 uh, locations where there's somebody starting to get a little bit more dedicated that is just kind of managing the traffic, if you will, of all the things that need to be assigned at the locations uh, and need to get accomplished and helping out the reporting. Uh, but to the point that uh, John is making here with uh, with a couple hundred locations, you can probably still manage with, it's a, it's a part of somebody's job, not dedicated. We had another one come through. So you mentioned that you're using Zenput both in the field and the store. So how do employees at the field and store level use Zenput? Is it computer, phone, tablet? What's kind of the mechanism they're working on? So our multi-unit supervisors, we all issue a company, um, you know, cell phone, um, iPhone that we all use. um, And they're all using it through their iPhone. Each store does have a tablet in their store that has a couple different apps on it that they can all use. And Zenput is loaded to that. And... um, the store also is all have Wi-Fi, so they're just connected right then and there to the Wi-Fi. And our team members can obviously piggyback off of that Wi-Fi too. And you know, if they wanted to use their cell phone or the tablet, they can connect to our Wi-Fi and do so as well. Great. Can you customize your forms, audits, and tasks in Zimput? Yeah, so once I like kind of refer back a little bit. So we have 
kind of an internal person that just kind of makes the forms and audits and tasks for me. <laughs> me myself, it's been quite a you know couple three years since I've tried to make his input form, but. If I just tell our director, hey, you know, let's develop this form out and work together of what we want on that form, then yeah, he can easily do it all. Very, you know, very easy and seamless. Great. Uh, and as for the tasks, those are very easy to do, like in the stores. We are very, you know, hey, look at, you know, put put this chair, you know, get this chair fixed and here's a task. So it'll remind and pop up on everybody's dashboard the next day. Cause I mean, I'm sure as everybody's out there as you're touring stores with a pup group of different people, you know, it's kind of hard to jot your notes down or get things done right then and there. So assigning that task that, Hey, when you sit down tonight or tomorrow morning to kind of review, you know, what you're doing, here's this task that you can look into from your notes with touring with everybody. Awesome. All right, I think we have time for one more. So how long did it take your team to actually get up and running with Zenput? Yeah, so we kind of talked on that earlier a little bit. Um, I took the wrong approach at first with kind of going to the store level. And at the time, we also didn't have Wi-Fi in all of our stores when we first did this. Um, and so we had some hiccups and then I kind of worked back with Vlad and his team and the team. And then we decided, hey, you know, we're already paying for our supervisors and they need to know how to answer any kind of questions and get the stores through this as well. Let's come back and evaluate. Let's roll, you know, kind of roll it out with our supervisors first. And once we did that, it was, um, I mean, not very long at all. I mean, within that first month, we were able to get everybody doing it the way we kind of wanted to do it. Awesome. And then do your stores log temperatures and sanitation logs? In the in the um, in his input form, yes. So we have like an opening checklist, a you know lunch checklist, a rush checklist, a closing check, you know that kind of thing. And they're logging in the temperatures into into those different forms. Yeah, typically to sort of uh, to, to piggyback on that uh, across the customer base, about uh, about ninety percent of our actual usage, um, maybe a little bit more these days, is actually day to day within the stores, and about ten percent is in the field. Um, so the, there's a there's a hefty amount that gets used um, at the store level, and then naturally that's also a reflection of the uh, of the amount of um, uh, field uh, field team members that you have relative to the amount of uh, store level employees that you have. Right. Great. Yeah, I think we're like 185 stores and like 22 field team members. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's how. Yep, that would yeah, about one to ten overall, one to nine, something like that. Yep. All right, great. Well, any other questions that have come through, we will follow up um, offline, but we really appreciate, John, your time today, and Vladek, thank you for running today's session. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Uh, thank you all. Thanks, John. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Thanks.